Okay, so I want to talk about electric motors and electric generators and Faraday's law. And and this, I'm approaching this from a standpoint for students like in an algebra-based physics course, so I'm not going to use any, there's no calculus, but there is going to be fun. Okay, so I have a picture of a motor there, and I'll come back to this motor later, but let's get started. Okay, so here is, oh, I'm not on this. Here is a hand crank generator. So you may have seen one of these before, they're kind of cool. Uh, you just turn the little crank, lights up the light bulb, everything's great. Okay, so I'm gonna go over the hand crank generator and then we're gonna talk about the electric motor. Now in particular, there's something really cool. If you crank this generator and you have it connected to something, you disconnect it, something happens. I'm not sure if you can tell in this video, but so it's spinning, 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 disconnect and it's super easy to spin. When it's connected, it's not easy to spin. So you can totally feel the difference when, when there's a load and when there's not a load. And that's what I want to explain. There's a lot of stuff to get into first, so let's just get started. Imagine that I have a magnetic field. I need to calculate something that we call the magnetic flux. So here's some surface area. It's some this rectangular, the square surface area. I can define the area as a vector, a vector A. So that vector A is perpendicular to the surface. So if you rotate the surface, the vector A changes too. And then if I have some magnetic field uh, vector B, then I can use B and A to calculate the magnetic flux. So we calculate magnetic flux, uh, and it would technically be phi B, because there are other types of fluxes, and just the dot product of B and A. And if you don't want to do dot products, you can just take the magnitude of B times the magnitude of A times the cosine of that angle between those two vectors, and that's the important part. Okay, so that's magnetic flux. That's not Faraday's law. Let's look at Faraday's law. Imagine that I have a coil of wire right there, and I take a magnet and I put it in there. This little meter down here is measuring the electric current, and you'll see that I get an electric current when I move the magnet in and out, but if I just hold the magnet there, I don't get an electric current. And so it's important that it's only when I'm changing the motion of the magnet that I get an electric current. And that's Faraday's law. So Faraday's law says that, oh, first I need to say, um, remember the change in potential. The change in electric potential we define as uh, the negative of the electric field dot the displacement. Now, what if I do that around some area, around some loop, okay? then if the electric field changes direction and the, the path link changes direction, I'd have to break it in small pieces and add up all those E dot DRs around the, around the whole path. And you do that in Ohm's law. Okay, and you get, oh, you said it's zero, not Ohm's law. Kirchhoff's loop rule says that the change in potential around the loop is zero. But in general, the change in potential for any electric field is just E dot DR, and you have to add up all the pieces. If it was calculus, you would integrate, but it's not calculus, so. Okay, so we call this uh, magnitude of the change of potential uh, around a loop, we call that the EMF, which stands for electromotive force. It's not a force. That's really just uh, what we call it historically. And Faraday's law says that if you change the magnetic flux, you create an EMF around a loop. So it depends on how fast you change that flux. So the rate of change of magnetic flux delta flux delta t, that's how fast the flux is changing. And then in here is the number of loops because each loop that you have, if you have one loop uh, or if you have two loops, you're gonna have twice the change in flux and so forth. So n is the number of loops. Okay, so here's a nice little picture of that. Uh, you can see down here, if I have some magnetic field, when we draw electric and magnetic field vectors in three dimensions, we use this little x dot notation. So a vector with an x is a vector going into, well, that'd be this way, coming into the paper. I'm pointing at myself. So suppose that I have a changing magnetic field in some region. That's going to create an electric field around this loop that we could calculate the flux through. And, and here's the most important thing. E dot dl around this loop is not zero, okay? So the change in potential is not zero. And since this looks a little bit different than um, the way we normally see electric fields, we call this a curly electric field. You don't need to know that, but that's, that's what that is. Okay, now let's talk about the relationship between electric field and electric current. So imagine that I have some material here, some metal, and it's got 
positive cores with free electrons that can move around. That's one of the things that's really nice about metals. Now I apply an external electric field, then those negative charges are gonna move, I got everything backwards, this way, right? They're gonna move that way, and that's gonna make an electric current. So we call that velocity that they move VE or VD for the drift velocity. So actually what happens is they would accelerate that way, but they collide with stuff and stop. So they accelerate, stop, accelerate, stop. They get some average velocity and that's the drift velocity. Now we like to think of electric current as the motion of positive charges. So if I have negative charges moving that way, that'd be the same as a positive charge moving that way. So the positive charges don't move. The point here is that if I have an electric field, I have an electric current. So this is my equation for the electric current. In this equation, N is the number of charge carriers per unit volume, E is the charge carrier, A is the cross-sectional area, and V is the drift velocity. But that drift velocity depends on the electric field, where U is some, we call that the electron mobility. All of this leads up to this idea of Ohm's law, where the change of potential across something, which depends on the electric field, uh, and the current depends on the electric field, uh, is related to just I times R, where R is the resistance of the wire. I have a whole video on this if you want, um, but that's the, the important thing is this, if we have an electric field, we have an electric current. Okay, so now what happens if I take a coil of wire, which I'm representing with the box here, there's actually, imagine a loop around that, and it has a length of L and a total resistance R, and there's some constant magnetic field there, and I rotate that, just like this. What happens and how do we deal with that? So the first thing is that the flux is going to change. Here is a uh, diagram showing two arrows. The, the blue, the cyan arrow shows the magnetic field at the center of the loop, and then the, the white is the area vector. And as that rotates, the angle between those changes. So the flux changes. And here you can see it in three dimensions. The flux is indeed changing the whole time. So when those two arrows are in the same direction, then the flux is maximum and where they're 90 degrees the cosine of 90 is zero so you have zero flux so it goes between positive flux zero negative zero positive and so forth so we're going to have rotating a coil in a loop of rotating a coil in a magnetic field will make uh, a changing flux so we can actually calculate that changing flux but here is the flux this is just the flux it's not the changing flux it's just the flux the flux does indeed change it's the same picture, but with a graph. Everyone likes a graph. But what I need is the rate of change of flux. Okay, so you could take a derivative of the flux with respect to time, and we could write this as a cosine function um, because it's the cosine of the angle between those that really matters. But I didn't want to use calculus, so we're not going to do that. So here's the, the flux as a function of time. How could I find the rate of change of flux? Well, we define EMF as change in flux over change in time. And imagine I take some short time interval. That's the flux at the end of the time interval minus the flux at the beginning of the time interval, flux two minus flux one. I left, I dropped off the B because it's just gonna get too messy. Okay, so here is some flux at some point, I'm gonna call it flux old now. And then a little bit later I have a new flux. Uh, and with that I can find the change in flux which actually be the slope between these two points. So I need the change in flux, delta phi, and the change in time, which is just the time step, or whatever that may be. So that would be the new flux minus the old flux divided by that delta t. Okay, so I can do this in a computer program. I can calculate the flux every single instant, which I just did, and then just say what's the old flux minus the new flux, and then that's my change in flux. And I will show you this code. Okay, I will show you the code at the end. I'm going to give a presentation, and at the end, if you want to stick around, I'll show you how that code works. I'll give you a link to the code anyway. Okay, so here is a plot of both the flux that you already saw with this change in flux. And I want to point out a couple of important things. One, look at this point right here. Can you see that point right there? That point, what is the flux? The flux is zero. What's the change in flux? It's up here, it's not zero. This flux, zero, that not zero. What about right here? 
right here, the change in flux is zero, right? Because it's crossing into the line, but the flux is not. But you'll notice that the flux is, the, it's, the slope of the line up there is zero. That's why the change in flux is zero right there. So, but they both kind of look like trig functions, right? If the flux looks like a cosine function, then this change in flux looks like a sine function. And spoiler alert, it is a sine function. And I'm gonna show you how you can get this. If you wanna skip this part, you skip this part. So here's my definition of EMF, uh, flux two minus flux one. And, and so the flux depends on B A cosine theta, but they both have the same A, they both have the same B, so I can factor that out. So it's really just cosine theta two minus cosine, cosine theta one, and that's multiplied by B A. All of that's divided by DT. Now, the coil's rotating with some angular velocity omega. We define omega as the change in theta with respect to time. It's the, it's the angular rate of change of the angle. It's the angular rate of change. It's the rate of change of the angle. So that's theta two minus theta one over delta t. Now, I can take this equation and multiply both sides by delta t and then add theta one to both sides. I get this equation. So this is the same thing. It just says, if I know the theta at the beginning and I know omega, for a short time interval, I can find the new theta. So I can update theta. And we're gonna be assuming a small delta t, so this is gonna be fine. Okay. Now I have, if I put that in for theta two, right? Theta two depends on the theta at the beginning and omega delta t. And so now I'm not gonna call it theta one, theta two, I'm just gonna call it theta. So I have B A cosine theta two, but instead of theta two, I have this down here, theta plus omega delta t and then have minus cosine theta that was there before. So what do we do with this cosine theta plus omega delta t? Okay, we're gonna use the trig identity. So this, I put a box around it because it's important. So if I have cosine of two angles, the sum of two angles, cosine of alpha plus beta, that's gonna be equal to the cosine of alpha times the cosine of beta minus the sine of alpha times the sine of beta. It's a trig identity. I'm not driving that, I'm using it. So if I use that here, then I have that cosine theta plus omega delta t. So theta would be like alpha, beta would be like omega delta t. And if I substitute that in, I get B over, B A over delta t, that didn't change. And then I have cosine theta times cosine omega delta t, and then I have minus sine theta times sine omega t, and then I have that cosine theta left over from before. And I, I factored out the delta t. Okay, so what we need to deal with this cosine omega delta t and sine omega delta t. So let's assume that delta t is very, very small. This makes omega delta t also very small. So imagine that I plot, I wanna look at what happens when cosine of theta is small, with theta is small, and sine when theta is small. Here is a plot of both cosine and sine for small angles. And, and this is you know up to just 0.9 radians, so it's not very small, very large. For the cosine up here, this term, it's very flat, right? So if I say cosine of theta and theta is very small, I could just say it's one, it's close to one, okay? Down here for sine, you'll notice this, this looks like a very straight line and it's a, it's a straight line with a slope of one, right? Because this goes from zero and this is 0 0.2, 0 0.2. So in this case, this is approximately the line of, uh, of theta equals theta, right? Because it's almost theta. So sine of a small angle is just equal to that angle. Cosine of a small angle is equal to approximately that value. So I have cosine of omega t. I don't, I'm just going to put that as one. And you think that's just cheating. You're cheating. No, I'm not cheating. It's, it's fine. It's fine. Trust me, it's fine. And then sine of omega t is just omega delta t. Omega delta t. I'm gonna put a box around that because it's kind of important. Now I can use those in my, in my, uh, my EMF. So I have BA over delta T, and then I have cosine theta, cosine omega T, sine theta, sine omega T. So this is just one, I already said that, and that's just omega T. So omega delta T, delta T, I'm just excited. So I get BA over delta T, cosine theta, minus the times one, and then sine theta times just omega delta t. So that's not, those are two separate terms. I should have switched them. And then the cosine minus, minus cosine theta. So then I have a cosine theta and a minus cosine theta and those cancel. 
So now I get just BA over delta T minus sine theta omega delta T and that delta T and that delta T cancels. So I get that. That's my EMF. That's my EMF as a function of theta. Assuming that it's moving with some angular velocity. You'll notice I get this omega term out front. Uh, if you took a derivative, you would get that omega too. You get the same thing. Uh, and, and remember, theta is not constant here. Theta is changing with time. Okay. So let's do this. Let's put in some realistic values. I have a, a coil length of 5 centimeters. Uh, I have a thousand terms. I'm not sure if that's legit or not. I kind of just made that up. Magnetic field of 0 0.01 Tesla, which is kind of high, but that's fine. Uh, and then I'm going to rotate this at, a, at 100 radians per second. And I have a coil resistance of 9 ohms. Because remember, I need that 9 ohm resistance because I'm actually calculating the electric field and then using that to calculate the electric current. So if I do that, I get the following current as a function of time. So that current changes because the rate of change of, of the flux changes. The rate of change of the flux changes, right? And so I get, I get a pretty decent current out of this loop, spinning it at 100 radians per second. But you'll notice something important here, that it starts off uh, some negative current and then some positive current and then negative current. So this is an AC current. It's AC. Now, there is a way that I could put like a diode in there and so that whenever the current's going in the opposite direction, uh, this would be a, with a, a, a rectifier. And you can just make those currents positive and it looks like that. Okay. So I still have a changing current, but now it's always positive and that would we would call DC current. And I cut it off with my head up here. Look at that because I wasn't really paying attention. That's fine. But remember, this is the we're only true because the electric field is proportional to the current in this case because we have a complete circuit. Okay, so here's what that looks like. Here is a rotating loop. That's the electric current, and you'll see the electric current is changing magnitude uh, and direction as the coil rotates around. It's not in real time because I want you to be able to see it. So I think that's kind of cool. Now we need to look at something else, magnetic force and torque. So if I have a, a wire in a magnetic field, then there will be a force on that wire. The force on the wire depends on the value of the current, the length of the wire, and the magnetic field. And that's the cross product. Okay, so for cross products, we have to deal with the right-hand rule. But I've, I've already I made a little three-dimensional diagram here for you. So if this is I delta L, uh, and that's B, the vector B, then the force has to be perpendicular to both of those, and we use the right-hand rule to find out which direction that would be, and so that would be your force. So that's an important, I'm not going to go over that a lot of detail, but it is kind of important. So imagine I have some loop at some position in the magnetic field like this. So there's my magnetic field vectors. Uh, this, you can see, is a wire coming out of the page. And so this has a current with this a dot. I'm using conventional current. And then on the other side, it's going into the page. So it's going, it's looping around. Okay. So I have this... Uh, magnetic field and the currents like that, I can calculate the magnetic force. For this wire, that would be up, right? Because I have the IDLs coming this way, Bs coming that way, that would give a force up. And on the bottom wire, since it's going into the page, this would have a downward force. The net force on this loop is zero, okay? But the torque is not zero. So this is a reminder from your previous semester in physics. Torque, we define torque as the cross product of R, R is the position, the vector from the axis of rotation to where the force is applied. So it's R cross F. You could write that as uh, R F sine theta, where theta is the angle between R and F. I should have put that in there, I didn't put that in there. So that gives, uh, I have two torques. The torque due to this wire would be the force F uh, R, which is L over two, if the length of the loop is L, this is going to be, this whole thing is L, this is L over 2, and then that's going to be sine theta. Uh, and I can do that for the other wire too, and they have the same value. They both have the same torque. They both want to make it rotate in the same direction. So I have two of them, and the twos cancel. Uh, now, I can put in my expression for the magnetic force as I, L, B, because they're I and B are perpendicular, uh, and I get N, the number of loops, I, the current L squared sine theta, 
and then I can just say L squared is the area. So I get N I A sine theta. So the torque depends on that angle that you're at. Okay, let's go ahead and do uh, look at the torque on this loop. So you'll notice that the torque changes because the torque depends on that current. As I generate, as I rotate that loop, then I'm creating an electric current. But now I have an electric current in a magnetic field and that produces a torque. So this answers our question. Going back to this, why does the, uh, why does it get easier to spin when I disconnect it? When I disconnect it, I'm still creating an electric field, but now there's no electric current. If there's no electric current, there's no torque. And so it's really easy to spin. So that makes sense, right? Because if, if, it's, if you're making an electric current, you're using that, you can make power, you have to have some energy input into the system. And that energy input is from you twisting that thing. So that's the answer to that first question. Why does it get easier when you disconnect the generator? And I know, look, I just spent, what was that? 21 slides talking about that, but we're not done. What about an electric motor? So this is one of my favorite things to do. Take that generator and connect it to a battery and you can see that it will turn. Because an electric motor and an electric generator are really the same thing. It's just how you use it. An electric motor, you run electric current through the coil and you can make it spin. And then in a generator, you spin the coil and you make electric current. Okay. So let's take uh, a coil and rotate it about a fixed axis. Because we need to, I can calculate the torque. We already talked about calculating the torque on a coil with current in it, but we need to talk about how we'd model that. So if I know the total torque on an, on an object about a, that's rotating about a fixed axis, then the torque is going to be equal to the moment of inertia times the angular accel acceleration alpha. And I know that doesn't look good, um, but we already calculated the torque, right? I just said it was N A I sine theta, and that's the important point. This is a difficult problem because the torque changes with angle. Okay, so this is the definition of moment of inertia. It's not important here. I just really want to show you that that I there is not the current I. This is the rotational mass. You can think of the rotational mass. How hard is it when you apply a torque? How do you get a relationship between that and the angular acceleration alpha? That's what that's there for. But I can calculate the torque if I know the angle. The angular acceleration alpha is defined as the rate of change of the angular velocity. So in some short time interval, it would be delta omega over delta t. And that would be the final omega, omega 2, minus initial omega, omega 1, divided by delta t. And then I could, just like the same trick I did before, I could um, multiply both sides by delta t and add omega 1. And I get, if I know the angular acceleration alpha and I know the angular velocity omega 1, I can find the new angular velocity omega 2. So that's important. And then I can also use the same trick I did before. If I know the angular velocity is the change in theta, I can find theta at the end. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna break this into small time steps. I'm gonna calculate the torque, and then I'm going to use that to update the angular velocity, use that to update the angular position theta, and that's gonna change the torque, so I'm gonna go back up to the beginning and do it all again. And I will show you this program at the end if you stay tuned. And if you don't have to stay tuned, if you need to go, you go. Okay. Or you could also just pause. But you do what you do you. So here's what that looks like. These red arrows show the force on the loop as it rotates. Uh, so this has a constant current in the loop and you'll notice that it does not make a very good motor. Because uh, at at one point once it switches over, I want to play this again. Once it switches over the force doesn't really change direction, but the torque does. Right now it's exerting a torque in the opposite direction. So it just rotates back and forth. That's not a very good motor. That's not what you want. So here's how to fix that. This is an actual motor, it's not running though. And as you spin it, notice these two uh, metal pieces at the top that are touching up there. What happens, the, we call those the brushes, and that's the commutator. And as the, the coil rotates around, it switches the contact point. So that essentially changes the direction of the electric current uh, in that loop. So when the coil rotates, I can change the current and then I can get the torque to always be in the same direction. So if I do that, I can do that in Python. 
this is what that looks looks like. Notice the direction of the, the yellow arrow switches as it rotates over, and I get a torque always in the same direction, and it just spins faster and faster and faster and faster. And in fact, in this model, it would keep speeding up forever. Um, it's not a complete straight line because the torque's not constant. Remember, the torque changes with angles. So uh, if the torque was constant, you'd have a, a perfectly straight line. So I can add uh, a drag torque. And so imagine that there's some other torque on there that depends on the angular velocity. So if I add that in there, then I get something like this. So this is a more realistic motor. And you notice the faster it goes, the greater that torque. So it's going to eventually reach some kind of equilibrium position. It's not going to keep spinning up forever. And this is what you would normally do, right? You'd put some load on the motor. You would use the motor to do something. At the very least, you'd have air drag, you'd have frictional drag forces, so it wouldn't keep spinning up forever. But here's the cool part. So here's an actual motor, uh, and I have it hooked up to an ammeter, so I'm measuring the current, and it's already spinning. So what happens as I take my finger and I put it on the top of the motor and slow down the motor, what happens to the electric current? The electric current's going up, right? So the slower that turns, the more current the motor uses. And this is kind of something important when you're talking about motors. Uh, a stopped motor is going to use way more current than a very, very fast spinning motor. You already knew this, right? When, well, you didn't know it, but when you get a sock stuck in the vacuum cleaner, the motor spins a lot faster um, because there's, not, there's no resistance from the air, and it actually uses less current. Now, it is bad. I'll go ahead and tell you. Stop motors are bad because high currents melt wires. So you don't want, high, you don't want to stop a motor. So to understand this, we need to know Lenz's law. I really don't like Lenz's law, but here it is. This is a really difficult idea. Uh, the direction of an induced electric current from Faraday's law will make a magnetic field if it was able to. That magnetic field opposes the change in flux. Let's look at an example. Here's a magnet. And I'm going to move it towards this coil of wire. So it's moving at some velocity v. So there's a magnetic field pointing that way. And the closer you get to a, a dipole magnet, the stronger the magnetic field is. So if I move it this way, then I'm going to be, oh, I skipped, I'm going to be, that's a little bit out of order. I'm going to be increasing the magnetic flux, right? Because the area is constant. Uh, actually, I showed it this way. The area is constant. No. Yes. This. Okay, the area is constant, but the magnetic field is increasing, so the flux is going to be increasing. That's going to induce a current. We know that. But the magnetic field that's induced wants to oppose that change. So it's going to be going that way. So that means that I have to have a magnetic, the induced magnetic field would be to the left, and the current would be uh, this way. And I can get that with the right-hand rule. I'll show you the right-hand rule in just a second. But now I'd have an electric current going around that way that's induced by that, that coil. Now suppose I pull the magnet away, then the magnetic field is still pointing that way, but it's decreasing, right? Because the magnetic field is decreasing, the magnetic flux is decreasing. So that means the magnetic field that's induced would be going in the same direction as the magnetic field, and the current would be going the opposite direction. And that's Lenz's law. I know it's pretty complicated. That, that really does get people all flustered. Okay, we need to also think about some simple circuit stuff here. So if I have a battery hooked up to a resistor, we're going to have the battery with the voltage EMF and a resistance of R. This is going to have Ohm's law says that the EMF is equal to the current times the resistance. Uh, so the current would be going that way. This is the positive side of the battery. Uh, that also means there's an electric field in the same direction, right? That There is an electric field there. And then I can calculate the current as EMF over R. I don't remember why I'm talking about this. Oh, right, right, right. I know why. Because if there's an EMF and it's a closed loop, there will be a current. That's the point. Whether that EMF is from a battery or from Faraday's law. Okay, so here is a rotating motor. So we're looking at it from the side like this. So right here I have the electric current coming out, out of the paper. And then down here it's going into the paper, into the screen. Uh, so I can calculate the magnetic force is up for the top part down for the bottom part, and it's rotating, in this case, it's rotating at that point like this, this way. 
So what's going to happen as it moves more and more towards uh, a, th a smaller theta? That's going to be an increasing flux in this case. The flux is increasing up to the point where the coil's completely vertical. If the coil, if the flux is increasing, then the induced magnetic field will oppose that, right? It doesn't want to do that. So the magnetic field is to the right mostly. So this is going to make an induced magnetic field going down and to the left. Uh, and so if you take your right hand, and this doesn't look like my right hand, uh, if you take your right hand to so look at the picture and your fingers coil in the direction of the electric current in a loop, your thumb points in the direction of the magnetic field. So that means that there would be an induced current in the opposite direction of the current from the magnetic field. Uh, so at the top up here, it's going into the board, into the screen, and out here it's coming out of the screen. Now you can't just add currents. We're not adding currents. We're adding electric fields. But remember, there, if you know the electric field, you know the electric current. Okay, so there's not two currents that are added together. I mean, you could kind of think of it that way if you want to. So, but what happens when the direction of the electric current changes? Once that motor flips past that vertical point, then the direction of the current changes. So now at the top of the coil, the current's going in, the bottom of the coil, the current's coming out. And so the force uh, is, that's right, I just moved this to the bottom, okay. But in this case, I have a decreasing flux, right? Because now the angle's moving more and more towards uh, negative 90 degrees if you want to think about it. So the flux is decreasing. That means that the loop wants to make a magnetic field in the same direction as the magnetic field, so it would be that way. Now we can use our right hand rule again and it would be induced current on the tops coming out of the paper and into the paper. But again, these are in opposite directions. So that tells me why I have a... The, this in, the important thing here is this changing flux depends on how fast it's rotating. The faster you rotate it, the greater the changing flux, the greater the change, the induced current. So the faster it rotates, the total current's gonna be smaller. If I stop this, then I have no induced current and it's just gonna be the current from the battery. So a stop motor is gonna have a much larger current than a rotating motor. And the faster it rotates, the lower the current draw. Okay, conclusions. Faraday's law, electric generators. So electric generators use Faraday's law. We're rotating a coil in a loop, changing magnetic flux that generates an EMF. If it's connected to a something, then there'll be an electric current and there'll be a torque. And so then we have torque on a rotating loop. I went over that. I'm not going to go over it again. Electric motors also re require torque on a rotating loop. Actually, they they torque on a loop that makes it rotate. Lenz's law it is important to find the direction of the induced current in a loop, and that gives us what we call this back EMF in an electric motor, uh, curly electric fields, and back EMF. Okay, so I told you I would show you this program. You can stop here. I'm going to show you this program. Uh, let's see if I can get it lined up. This is one of the programs. I'm going to go over it really briefly. Let's see if I make this a little bit bigger. This is I have several versions of this. And so there's, a, I make messy code. I'll tell you right now, my code's messy. Okay, let me go over the different parts of this program. Up here, this is just stuff for making a graph. That's all that is. Uh, there's my B vector. One of the nice things about GlowScript vPython, Web vPython, is that we can use vector quantities. Uh, B scale, that's just a number so that I can draw arrows, right? Because those arrows have particular size. B scale takes to trans, uh, translate the magnitude of the magnetic field into a size. Uh, here's my length of my wire, which I said is 0.05, but I was 0.06. The resistance in the coil, number of turns. K is that drag coefficient for rotating loop. Um, so right here, I have uh, six arrows. These six arrows all, that's just the magnetic field, these magnetic field arrows over here, just so you can see them. Uh, then I have the coil. Uh, that's my my square. Uh, that's technically a box in GlowScript vPython. Uh, and then one of the things that that's easy to do to make rotations in Python, we use the rotate function. So if I say coil.rotate, I tell it about what point I want to rotate it, what axis and what angle. So I actually made the box originally like this and then I rotated it so it started off like that. So 
Uh, that's my angular velocity, that's my initial angle, and then this is my time and my time step. Um, this is the, I don't think I use that in this program, but this was the arrow representing the area. And I don't know why I called it A-R-E. Area arrow, that's what it was. And arrow is a type of object in, in Python. And then the area, actual area vector, the, um, this one I made small so you could see it, but the actual area vector I didn't display, it's just a number. But it is a vector. Norm is a unit vector in the same direction as the axis of that thing. Okay, phi old. So in order to calculate the, the flux, I can calculate the flux. Uh, it's just b dot a, which is great. I can use the dot product. Um, but how do you do the change in flux? Well, what I do is I calculate the flux at the beginning. I move everything one time step ahead, and then later I'll calculate the flux again, and I can say the new flux minus the old flux to calculate the change in flux. Okay, this i scales to draw the, the current arrows. Uh, these p1, p2, l1, l2, p1, p2, p3, p4 are just points on the coil that... I'm going to rotate around. I need to move them around as the coil rotates because that's where I'm going to draw my arrow from. And then L1, L2, L3, L4 are vectors in the direction of the wire because as the coil rotates, those directions change too. Uh, F scale is just the scale for the force. Uh, and then these are my current arrows I1 through I4 and my force arrows F1 through F4. Uh, IM is my moment of inertia. So I call it IM. Uh, okay, so this is just a loop, rate. This, remember I had to change the direction of the current back and forth? So at the beginning, I always make the current positive. And then if the angle is past a certain degree, then I'm going to make it negative. And that's that commutator brush thing. Uh, now there's another problem is that my angle just keeps increasing forever. So what I do is once I get to 2 pi, I set it back to 0. So if the angle is greater than 2 pi, I just put it at 0. And that way I can have, I can know where I'm at. There's other ways you could have done that. You could have done like uh, mod or div or something like that and it would have worked, but I didn't do that. So that just switches the current back and forth. Now I need to move, uh, recalculate the location of the points, P1, P2, P3, P4, and the L1, L2, L3, L4. Uh, this calculates the torque. Um, this is the new area vector because that changes. Uh, this updates the angular velocity, updates the angular position, rotates the coil, uh, these draw all the currents and the forces with their angles and positions, uh, and then I graph it. Uh, I don't have one here where I did the change in flux. I, oh, here it is. It was something like this. So here you see I set the old flux to the new flux. It would be like um, d phi, which is not is going to be uh, phi minus old phi. No phi old divided by dt. And then I'll calculate the, that rate of change and then down here I need to set the old phi to the new phi so I can do it all again. And that's that. So when you run it, it looks like this. And there's a problem. Can't find variable phi. Okay, let's just get rid of this stuff. I did it in another one. Okay, and there you go. Cool? Whew, okay, so there you go. I hope you enjoyed that. I enjoyed it. It was fun for me. It took me a long time to make all those slides, so I don't know what I'm saying by that, but I'll talk to you later.